up with you. Would you open it to the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and I'm just going to read you eight verses. I'm going to actually read it from the modern English version. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, which in Hebrew is called Bethesda, having five porches. And in these lay a great crowd of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And after the stirring of the water, whoever stepped in first was healed of whatever disease he had. A certain man was there who had an illness for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been in that condition now a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Immediately, the man was healed took up his bed and walked. Got it? So um, just for a couple of weeks, we are going to revisit a subject that we looked at a few years ago here at Treadworth. Lots of you weren't even here then, so, um, and the rest of you probably forgotten it. So it's worth, it's worth repeating. It's interesting, isn't it? We can sing the same old songs week after week after week, but I get worried preaching something that I preached four years ago. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So um, back then I called this series, Are You Up For It? Are You Up For It? It was, a, it ba- it was a, at a time of great change and regeneration in our church after a few difficult years. And almost four years on from that, we've seen some real development in terms of what's happening in the international Kingfisher family. There's been huge changes and developments in Treasure Seekers, of course. Um, We've had the launch of Kingfisher Westgate, and we've also had the upgrading of this building with a new ceiling, a new aircon heating system, some redecoration, as many of us decided that we were up for the challenge. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And as we enter this this new season, Like I said earlier, I believe God wants to strengthen us, to build a resilience within us for the future. And that is going to take some stretching of us. So in preparation for that, I want to revisit this subject matter. But rather than asking the question, are you up for it? This time I'm taking that as red because you're still here, okay? (laughs) And instead I'm calling it on the up, on the up. We've been reclaiming some ground over the last year, and we've seen more people connecting into um, groups and wanting to move forward with God. And I don't know about how you see it, but I really do believe that Kingfisher Treadworth is heading in an upward trajectory. Up. Up. It's a funny little word, isn't it? Up. We use it all the time in a variety of ways. We know what it means, yeah? Up to go Upward, towards the sky. (laughs) It's not rocket science. (laughs) But when we awaken in the morning, why do we wake up? At a meeting, why does a topic come up? Why do we speak up? Why are the candidates up for an election? And why is it up to the secretary to write up a report? We call up our friends. We brighten up a room. We work up an appetite. We warm up the leftovers, we clean up the kitchen, we lock up the house and fix up the old car. People stir up trouble and think up excuses. To be dressed is one thing, to to be dressed up is quite another. A drain must be opened up because it's blocked up. When it threatens to rain, we say it's clouding up. And when the sun comes out, we say it's clearing up. We use it all the time. We open up our shop in the morning and we close it up at night. When we get things wrong, we say we've messed. I could go on, but I need to wrap it. (laughs) Otherwise, my time will be, and you'll be fed. 
<laughs> so it's time to shut. <laughs> All right. You know, if we are going to achieve what God wants us to achieve, if our church is going to be a strong, vibrant force for good in our community, then we need to be clear and intentional about those things that will keep us moving upwards. Yes. Keep saying it. (laughs) Every time it comes up. Uh, And like I said, I think we are moving up here at Kingfisher Treadworth. You know, our interactive service, our 1130 service, has really grown over this last year especially. Uh, with people who have additional needs and um, the work that is now developing with Star College and we're looking at how to engage people more and how to engage their carers more. We're seeing an increase in youth on a Friday night. There's been a real increase in the amount of families with young children accessing our groups. We've had a number of babies born in our church lately. We are hitting another era of young families here at church. So, um, And then Celebrate Recovery is something else that was launched since we thought about being up for it. And it's now established here every week, um, every Thursday night, and it needs to go up to the next level. So the phrase on the up and up actually means honest, sincere, can be trusted, improving all the time. Honest, sincere, can be trusted, improving all the time. Do you want to be known as that? I want to be known as as that. And that's certainly how I want us people to see us as a local church, not just settling for what is, but with honesty and sincerity seeking to grow in fruitfulness and in influence. So today we're looking at rise up. Rise up. It's our starting place because nothing else can happen until we make that decision to rise up and make a shift. Why do we need to rise up? I'll tell you, because many of us get so used to being down that it becomes our normal. And we settle and we accept that that is just the way it is. So I want to break that mentality this morning. Did I say mentality? I meant mentality. (laughs) With a challenge that every one of us can rise. You know, if not physically, then definitely mentally and spiritually. And there are always new levels to rise to. So what is getting you down right now? What is trying to take you down? What is keeping you down? You know, one in five adults in the UK, that's 20% of our population, are estimated to suffer depression. You know, and for a lot of people, even in our church family here, depression is a very real struggle. You know, it's characterized by low mood, loss of appetite, loss of concentration. It describes a, a decrease, a lowering. We lump it all together and we say, I am so down, down. Other, others of us, we wouldn't say we were depressed, but boy, if we've got some things that are pressing us down, heavy burdens that we're carrying around with us, anxieties, relationship problems, addictions, stressful work situations, health issues, debt, irrational fears, secrets. And we feel the weight of this stuff bearing down on us. And in the account that we read, we were told that a certain man was there who had an illness for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there, note his position, and knew that he had been in that condition now a long time. You know, here is a man who has been down for 38 years. On the floor, lying there. And Jesus knew it. The first thing I want to point out this morning is that wherever you are in your life, and whatever you have been weighed down with, God knows. He, he, does, he does see it. Nothing in your life comes as a shock to him. He is not panicked by your situation. And if you'll let him, he can help you with those things. You know, interestingly, Jesus' first words to this man are these. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? I mean, it seems a really strange question, doesn't it? I mean, this man's been coming to this pool for years, 38 years because there might be the possibility 
of healing. It's obvious, isn't it? Surely, of course he wants to be healed. But the man doesn't even answer Jesus' question. Did you notice? He just comes up with the reasons why it's never going to work. He focuses on the unfairness and the impossibility of anything changing. Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm coming, another steps down before me. You know, it's so often the same for us. We may have been struggling for years with things that don't ever seem to change. And it's been so long now that we've stopped believing that anyone can help. We've stopped hoping that it can be different. We come up with all the reasons why it's never going to work. And we end up like the man who we read was in a crowd of invalids, just hanging out with those who are like us. That becomes our norm. That becomes our community. That becomes our comfort. You know, I've seen it in my work with addiction. I mean, to get truly clean of drugs or alcohol doesn't mean I don't use those things anymore and I just don't drink. It often means changing where I hang out. It often means changing the people that I associate with. It often means having to fill my life with completely different things, make new relationships. So the question, do you want to be healed, is a legitimate question. Not so much as do you want to feel well. That's a no-brainer. Of course. But do you want the change of life that that healing is going to mean for you? Do you want the miracle, and are you prepared to walk where that miracle is going to take you? You know, on this occasion, Jesus doesn't get into a discussion about all the reasons why this man can't do something. He simply says, rise, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was healed, took up his bed and walked. You know, out of that crowd of people that were hanging around that pool. Jesus saw something in this one man. Something. Something. He wanted something different. And he could see it. He just needed the man to see it for himself. And he's still looking for the one today. Make no mistake. Even in our congregation here this morning. One person who will not let the past be the greatest determiner of your future. Rise up. Are you going to be someone who always comes up with the reasons why something is not going to work? And I get that because, you know, when things have stayed the same for a long time, you don't want to set yourself up for more disappointment. Or will you dare to do something different? Will you dare to live differently. You know, in the struggles and the doubts and the insecurities that I've, I've had in my life, one thing I've learned, one thing that I've acted on is that if Jesus says I can, then he believes I can. If he believes I can, then who am I going to trust? So when it's come to things like further education, when it's come to preaching, when it's come to any of um, any of those situations where I've heard him say, rise up. I've had to battle the thoughts of I'm not capable. I've had to battle the thoughts of this won't work or I can't do it. And rather than just being paralyzed by those thoughts, I've chosen to trust him and I've made a move, made a shift. I've done my best to rise up. And that's when life changes, actually. That's when I start seeing change. That's when I start moving forwards and upwards. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1, we read, Arise from spiritual depression to a new life. Shine, be radiant with the glory and brilliance of the Lord, for your light has come and the glory and brilliance of the Lord has risen upon you. You know, this is not a talk telling you you need to try harder. Please don't hear that. I'm not telling you to deny anything that you are feeling or the facts of what you are living with or pretending things are great when they're really not. That is not what I'm saying. It's not a call to exercise more willpower, but it is about challenging where we may have settled and we need a restored hope that there is help to be found when Jesus 
is on the scene. And you can be radiant with his glory and brilliance. We don't have to try and muster up our own. And as we hear his command to rise up, I want to give you three ways you and I can practically respond, which is going to help us to do just that. And the first is this. They're not difficult. Look up. Look up. The first thing that man had to do when he was in that position on the floor was to look up at Jesus. Look up. When his eyes were down on himself, all he could think of was why he couldn't get to the pool. And it's the same for us. When we look at ourselves, the only posture you find yourself in is head down. Look at yourself. No, I'm telling you to. Look at yourself. <laughs> look at yourself. All the heads go down. Look at yourself. When you look at yourself, your head goes down. You can't look at yourself without your eyes being down. And that's the trap we fall into because the more we become consumed with ourselves, and our situations, the more we stay looking down. But it will never be within ourselves that we find the answers. It's not there that we find the hope. Only as we look. <laughs> You'll get there by the end of it. Look up. In the book of Genesis, when Abraham and his wife were struggling with infertility, we read, Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Look up. God says, never mind the facts down here right now. I know the truth. I have made you a promise and you can trust me. Look up. When the disciples and Jesus were faced with 5,000 and more hungry and tired people and only a few miserly bits of bread and fish to feed them this is what we read jesus took the five loaves and two fish he looked toward heaven and blessed them then breaking the loaves into pieces he kept giving the bread to his disciples so they could distribute it to the people he didn't get consumed with the scale of the problem but he trusted that god had a better perspective look up the psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When you're looking for help, when you need hope, where are you looking? <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I'm sure it's not always our reality, but that's, that's what you should do. That is where I'm encouraging you to look up. If you are just asking Google, or if you're looking to other people to sort out your issues and to give you the answers and solutions, then sooner or later you're going to end up disappointed, disillusioned, and downhearted. You know, the man at the pool said, I've got no one. When I try, someone else gets ahead. I'm, I'm not good enough. People have let me down. Why even try anymore? But the moment he looked up and saw Jesus, everything changed. We need God's perspective. We need his genius. When we fix our gaze on him, anything becomes possible. Hope rises. So look up. Secondly, lift up. Lift up. We need to lift up our hands. Lift up our hands. What does this posture mean? Surrender. <laughs> it's only when we come to the end of ourselves that we can truly accept help. You know, in any 12-step program, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the 12 steps from Alcoholics Anonymous or a number of the other 12-step fellowships, or even our very own Celebrate Recovery. But um, recovery starts with these three steps. Number one is we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, and that our lives had become unmanageable. Number two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. It works. Surrendering is saying, God, 
I don't have all the answers, but I believe that you do, and I'm going to trust you. It's deciding to pray rather than to stress and to strive, and not just to focus on what's wrong, but to try and see beyond the circumstances. There's a bigger picture. There always is. Listen to this in Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. In other words, God, it feels like I'm in a desert. Has anybody ever felt like that? Nothing's happening. Nothing's growing. I'm, I'm lost. I'm tired. I'm upset. I need you. You ever prayed any of those, oh God, prayers? I have regularly. <laughs> but then watch how this tone changes in the very next verse as the psalmist changes his focus. He says, I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed up on your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. It's when we surrender. It's when we lift up our heads, lift up our eyes, lift up our hearts, lift up our hands in prayer that our focus shifts from us to God. And when it does, watch this. This is from James 4, verse 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. In the message version, it says, get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. So I told you this isn't about you having to do more. It's actually about us learning to surrender, to strive less, to rest in only what Jesus can do. So we look up, we lift up, and then we're able to stand up and walk. Isaiah 40, verse 29 to 31. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who has no might, he increases power. Even youths grow tired and weary, and vigorous young men stumble badly. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him, will gain new strength and renew their power. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God, like eagles rising towards the sun. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not grow tired. You don't see eagles flapping their wings, madly trying to stay up, do you? They soar, they glide. That's what happens when you're not trying to work it all out for yourself, but you, you get close to Jesus. Let me read to you this modern-day parable. It says that an addict fell in a hole and couldn't get out. A businessman went by, and the addict called out for help. The businessman threw him some money and told him to buy himself a ladder, but the addict could not buy a ladder in this hole he was in. A doctor walked by, and the addict said, Help, I can't get out. The doctor gave him some drugs and said, take this, it will relieve the pain. The addict said, thanks, but when the pills ran out, he was still in the hole. A well-known psychiatrist rode by and heard the addict's cry for help. He stopped and asked, how did you get there? Were you born there? Did your parents put you in there? Tell me about yourself. It will alleviate your sense of loneliness. So the addict talked with him for an hour, and then the psychiatrist had to leave, but he said he'd be back next week. The addict thanked him, but he was still in the hole. A priest came by, and the addict called for help. The priest gave him a Bible and said, I'll say a prayer for you. He got down on his knees and prayed for the addict, then he left. The addict was very grateful. He read the Bible, but he was still stuck in the hole. A recovering addict happened to be passing by, and the addict cried out, Hey, help me, I'm stuck in this hole. Right away, the recovering addict jumped down in the hole with him. And the addict said, What are you doing? Now we're both stuck here. But the recovering addict said, it's okay. I've been here before. I know how to get out. Now, that might be a story about addiction. But actually, all of us humans, in very many different ways, we get stuck in pits. I don't know if you can relate to that. And it's like we can't find a way out. And there's plenty of philosophies, plenty of self-help techniques or religions, which all have their take on how to help. 
But it's only in Christianity do we see God jumping into the hole with us. It's only ever been Jesus who came down to where we were to find us and to show us the way out. He came down from earth, from heaven. He identified with us. He went down to the grave when he died on a cross, but then he was raised to life. Then he ascended into heaven. And when you decide to truly follow Jesus, it's always in that upward trajectory, spiritually speaking. This is from Ephesians chapter 2. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, down, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us up from the dead, along with Christ, and seated us with him up in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. You know, it's all about what Jesus has done for us. The man in the story that we read, he tried to do it his way for 38 years and it didn't work. He was no better off. But just one encounter with Jesus and he, he stood up. He picked up his mat. He took control of the very thing that he had been lying on for 38 years. And then he started walking. You know, it's easier to rise when you know that the ground under you is strong and supportive. Then you have the confidence to stand firm. And this is what the death and resurrection of Jesus means for us. Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Rise up. I don't think it's any coincidence where this story happened. You might have missed this, but we read that it was by the sheep gate. Now, the sheep gate was the gate where the lambs for the sacrifice in the temple would be bought. And it's here that we find Jesus. Now, who was he? He was our sacrificial lamb. He was the one who came to carry our burdens. He's the one who takes our sin, who lifts those burdens, who lifts us from the ashes and seats us with him in heavenly places. He's the one who called himself the gate for the sheep. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. That's the goal. That's the prize as we trust in Jesus, as we look to him, as we surrender to him, as we stand upon him. If we're going to think about getting into the stretch zone in a few weeks' time, then we need to be prepared to think differently, prepared to move. So look up, lift up, stand up. In other words, rise up. Would you rise up if you're able from your seats this morning? And we're going to pray. Father, you know each one of us. You know our situations. Lord, you know the pits that we so often find ourselves in and we just don't know how to get out. But Lord, I pray that this morning you would help us just from your word to change, to lift us awake this morning where we become